The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to the Stoa, everyone. My name is Alyssa Polizzi, and I'm here today with Aaron Rogerson. Today is the fourth event in the Shadow Play Speaker Series, a collection of discussions with the extended Jungian community and beyond, where we hope to explore a wide range of topics regarding the shadow in all its forms and manifestations. So today we are joined by Lisa Marciano, Jungian analyst, host of this Jungian Life podcast and author of her new book, Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, which will be released May 25th. Okay, today we'll have a discussion for about 30 minutes, followed by Q&A. So if you have questions for Lisa, please throw them into the chat. And during the Q&A portion, we will ask you to unmute and ask your question. Um, this is going to be recorded and posted to YouTube. So if for some reason you don't want to be on camera or have your voice captured, please just communicate that in the chat and um, we will read the question for you. So um, we ask you that during the discussion portion, the first 30 minutes, if you will turn off your video. Um, so the recording that appears on YouTube will just have the three of us. Uh, that would be great. So please turn off your video now before we start the discussion. Okay, so uh, hello, Lisa. Thank you so much for joining us. How is it going today? Uh, it's going okay today. It's above freezing here in Philadelphia, so it's a good day. Okay, awesome. Uh, so the speaker series is focused on the shadow, and just for anyone who's joining us who might be unfamiliar with the concept, Lisa, how would you describe the shadow in your own words? Well, um, Jung said something like, the shadow is everything we don't want to be. It's those parts of ourselves that we have disallowed, that we've cut off from, that we um, would rather not know about ourselves. And so we often meet it first in projection on other people. Thank you, Lisa. So today we wanted to explore the concept of motherhood as this uh, vessel of individuation where you can really grow into personhood, but also face a lot of different elements of your shadow. So how do you believe the challenges of motherhood really serve as that vehicle for individuation and self-discovery? I think there are so many ways that motherhood, I mean, let's say any serious commitment in life, whether it's a relationship or a career or a parenting, whether you're a mother or a father, anytime that you really throw yourself into life's furnace by committing yourself deeply to something, you're going to rub up against different parts of yourself. And, you know, the book obviously focuses on motherhood and, and was grew out of my experience mothering my own kids. But I think a lot of what I say in the book applies widely to lots of different kinds of pursuits. Uh, to, to talk about parenting in particular, you know, it is such an all encompassing feat to raise a child. And there are such uh, intensities of emotion that's physically exhausting. It's, um, you know, Faye Weldon, <laughs> Faye Weldon said, the novelist, the, the, the nicest thing about, about, the best part about not having children is that you can go on believing you're a good person. And I think that really says a lot about the topic we're talking about today and, and shadow. Raising children tests you in all kinds of ways and you will eventually get enraged at your children and do or say something awful. And that's exactly what Faye Weldon's talking about. You maybe didn't know that you had the capacity to be that gleeful uh, when you see someone that you love so much um, be so hurt, you know, as I remember one time um, giving my daughter a bath and she was just being impossible and it had been a really long day and uh, she was complaining that the water was too hot, even though it was tepid and I probably turned it up a little too cold and dumped some on her and she was unhappy and I, I enjoyed it and I thought, oh my God. I didn't know I could, I didn't know I could enjoy making someone I love unhappy. I didn't know I had that in me too, but there it was. 
So we're really going to meet parts of ourselves we did not want to know about. When we talk about the personal experiences of becoming a mother or having a mother, we're getting into more of that grounded uh, element of the archetypal realm of the mother and of parenting. But what would you say is the kind of shadow of the mother uh, versus the shadow of the father from the more archetypal sense and how that's expressed? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so if we're talking about the archetypal mother, I mean, obviously there's two poles to every archetype. There's the, the light pole and the dark pole. And the light pole of the mother is typified by, we can think of the Virgin Mary holding, holding the baby and all those beautiful Renaissance paintings. You know, it's this, it's life-giving, it's nurturing, it's, it's warm, it's generative. But the death mother, which we can think about maybe the goddess Kali in her destructive form. I mean, Kali in, in some of the iconography eats her children. Um, and, and, and so I think that the, the death mother is, um, uh, you know, and those of us who have had, a, you know, a, a profoundly negative personal mother kind of know that in our bones you know, what that's like. And it's, it is um, devouring, I think, is, is the word. And in, in terms of the, the, negative, the negative father, you know, I think um, having a, a negative mother complex makes us feel like, or, or being in touch with the negative pole of the archetype, it really makes you feel like uh, you're not even sure you have a right to be here. Whereas I, I think at least in the psyche of a woman, have the influence of the negative pull of the father archetype is something more along the lines of not good enough. So it's almost more fundamental, the negative pull of the mother archetype. In a lot of fairy tale and myths, we see the, the kind of triple goddess, the maiden, the mother and the crone. How do you believe that expresses the development of the feminine principle, especially moving from that early maidenhood into the mother, that initiatory process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. I, I like that you use the term initiatory, Alyssa. I think that that is that's there's this kind of unfolding initiation that that women go through, and that motherhood can certainly be part of that. And I explore that in the book in terms of. Um, you know, it, it, part of what can happen over the course of becoming a mother, and I've seen this in my own life and in the, 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 the stories of the women that I've worked with who are mothers, is a kind of claiming of authority. And that's very much related to shadow because I don't believe that we can hold authority until we have a capacity, until we have a handle on our own aggressive capacity. And we can't have that until we've dealt some with our own shadow and faced it and integrated it. So these are very closely linked. And I think that, you know, by the time you've um, been a mother for some time, hopefully if you weren't good at claiming authority or holding authority before you had kids, hopefully you get there over the course of parenting. And that sets you up very well for your, your crone years when you, you just, you stop being concerned about so much about what other people think and you can really um, take your own counsel. Do you believe the crone or maybe the dark pole of the mother is really what works on a more psychic level to bring the maiden into deeper personhood, like looking at Vasilisa the Beautiful or even some of the, the Disney classics where you have that kind of darker devouring mother or the Baba Yaga figure, the kind of uh, more chthonic crone who really kind of draws the maiden out of innocence. Hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And um, is to, to put it in the realm of Vasilisa the Beautiful for a minute. Um, so for those of you who maybe don't know, it starts off kind of as a Cinderella tale. There's been a very good mother who has passed away and she's left her daughter Vasilisa, this little doll. And the doll is kind of magic and the doll comes alive and will uh, do Vasilisa's task for her and cheer her up and that kind of thing. But Vasilisa is very um, beset by this, you know, wicked stepmother and wicked stepsisters. And they want to get rid of her. So they send her off into the Russian forest at night and they say, 
go to the hut of Baba Yaga and bring us back a light. Well, Baba Yaga, you know, eats people for dinner. So this is, this is, you know, she's not supposed to come home, but when she gets to Baba Yaga's hut, Baba Yaga says, okay, maybe I'll give you what you want, but you have to serve me. So there is this kind of, you have to serve the dark goddess. And, you know, what, what I've decided about this fairy tale after pondering it for a long time is Vasilisa really does have a good mother and, and good mothers can give us very much what Vasilisa has, which is sort of an inner resource. I think of the doll as an image of an inner resource that when we're feeling, when we're feeling dejected, we have the ability to talk to ourselves. One of the things the doll says to her always is go to sleep now, Vasilisa, for the morning is wiser than the evening. And I think that um, when we've got an internalized good mother, when we're in distress, we can kind of talk to ourselves and say, oh, yeah, this is really hard what I'm going through, but you know what? I, I need to just not think about this right now because I'm too upset. So let me go, let me maybe go fix myself something to eat and then maybe I'll sit and journal for a few minutes and then I can think about this. You know, it's, it's like we can be our own good mother. Um, but the thing that the good mother doesn't teach her daughter most of the time is how to be a bitch. And, and that is something we also have to learn. And so it is, Vas it is uh, Baba Yaga that teaches Vasilisa the dark stuff. So we do have to kind of apprentice to the dark goddess so that we can come, so that we can integrate shadow and claim our aggressive capacity. And then that is this kind of initiation. Lisa, do you think that becoming a mother is necessary for a woman to fully individuate or to complete the feminine arc or can there be a non-mother path for women to individuate? Oh, oh, I absolutely do not think that motherhood is the only way to individuate or complete the arc. I think any generative activity, any way that we're engaged in the world and we're concerning ourselves with our legacy um, accomplishes very much the same thing. So um, while, while you know, I wanted to lift up the particular way that motherhood can do this, but in, in no way do I think it's the only way. Uh, children are very vulnerable to their parents and they have trouble mirroring back the way they might feel they're being treated. Do you think this makes them uh, an easy target for shadow projections? Oh, yes, very, very much. I think th there's a, a, a chapter in the book about that. And I, I think this happens all the time. I think every parent projects shadow to one degree or another on, on our children. We just do. So the, the parts, the little story that I use in, um, in the book is, uh, <laughs> I remember I was studying for the exams when I was in analytic training. There are these big um, the propedeutic exams and I was very uh, engaged in studying for them. And my daughter was about five and I was feeling really dejected. I, I was I'm just not getting this material. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. I was feeling really disheartened by it. and kind of behind my peers and um and that that day i i started uh this particular day i i i saw this little boy about my daughter's age ride by on his two-wheeler bike and i thought my my daughter's not doing that yet she's not even interested in trying and what's wrong with her and why is she so far behind and and i spent about an hour thinking about that and suddenly i was like oh <laughs> Oh, 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 that's my stuff. Oh, look at that. You know, so I just think it happens in little ways and big and in and of itself, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to see our own shadow. I said in the beginning, we often meet the shadow in projection. Well, there it was. And that, that was humbling for me, of course, and it gave me a chance to reflect on, on, on my own sort of feelings of inadequacy that were that were very shadowy that I was putting on her. Lisa, how do you feel a child's development is impacted when the mother is absent, whether that's due to some sort of circumstance, a death, maybe they're just uh, emotionally unavailable, anything like well, that? Well, of course, this, this can have a huge effect on uh, the psyche of a, of a child. And I think when we think about it from a Jungian standpoint, I mean, of course, there are many schools of thought about this and a lot has been written and we could look at it from any number of lenses, but particularly from an archetypal standpoint, 
One of the things that Jung says is that um, we all come into the world with, uh, you know, sort of a, a faculty for perceiving archetypes and archetypes are sort of like patterns before experience. So according to Jung, we come into the world with a sense of mother already built in, sort of uh, uh, an ability to receive that pattern. And over the course of time, our interactions with our actual mother help us mediate the archetype. They help us personalize it. So there's the archetype of the great mother, and then there's our own experience with our personal mother. And if those are good enough, then the archetype kind of gets grounded. If we don't have that for some reason, if she's absent for whatever reason, we may have trouble grounding that archetypal energy. And, and so it might exist in us or we might be susceptible to it in a way that it's, it's kind of got too much of a charge because it's never been fully humanized. What do you make of the rise of the feminine in our culture? And do you think there's like an accompanying feminine shadow that is rising as well? Has there been a rise in the feminine? Maybe not. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, women have more political power than they used to, but I'm, I'm tracking um, the feminine in terms of more of the archetypal sense and the, the feminine principle, which I think of as being more about relatedness and um, sort of contextualized. Um, and, and I think that there's a way in which our society is less in touch with those elements than almost ever before. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, uh, let's see if I can do this <laughs> without turning it into a, um, a long lecture. Um, you know, I, I'm, I've been really struck by reading the book, The Master and His Emissary. And I think that, um, you know, he, he talks about the nature of the world that comes into being when there's a kind of left brain focus versus a right brain focus. And that the, the left brain is very instrumental and decontextualized and um, mechanistic and um, kind of, you know, the tree instead of the forest. And, and the right brain focus is much more about um, kind of metaphor and gestalt and um, the relatedness of things and uh, the implicit rather than the explicit. And I, I, reading that book, which is just a brilliant, brilliant book, I found myself thinking, those are pretty good descriptor, descriptors of what Jung was talking about with the, the masculine principle versus the feminine principle. And, and one of the things that McGilchrist, the author of the book says is that the master is the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere is supposed to be the servant, but the servant has usurped the master and he, he traces uh, the arc of civilization in terms of um, how these two aspects of our consciousness relate to one another and brings us up to the present day and says, you know, we, we are living in a world that is so highly um, sort of decontextualized. And I think about uh, the nature of, um, of sort of like living online, which I do as much as anyone else, and I love it. But boy, that cuts you off. It, 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 it disembodies you. It cuts you off from nature. And I, I think about some of the things that in particular younger people are struggling with in terms of um, identity issues and uh, the depression and anxiety that teen girls, for example, are facing in record numbers, partly because we think of you know, all of this being bombarded with stuff from smartphones. And I think, yeah, and, and there's somewhere in there, there's this loss of this feminine principle. So I realize that that's kind of a very, um, maybe superficial gloss, but, uh, but hopefully that gives you some idea of my thinking. 
How do you believe the loss of that feminine principle or the disconnection affects uh, parents, specifically the mother? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, a another part of that, I think, would be an, a relationship with the instinctual. And Jung was very, very clear. You know, he said multiple times throughout the collected works that most of our pathology or our suffering comes from being disconnected from our instincts, which of course we could we could talk then about um, the relationship between our, our instincts and our bodies, because, because part of the feminine principle is being embodied, being in your body um, and, and receiving that kind of instinctual wisdom. And so I think that if we are, if we do have trouble kind of finding that feminine principle and not on an individual level, some of us do very well with this. You know, I'm, I'm, what I was talking about before was more on a cultural level, but on an individual level, we might be very in touch with our bodies, with the feminine principle, with our instincts. If we're not, however, gosh, it is really hard, I think, to mother because mothering does require uh, a relationship with the instincts. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why motherhood can be a healing journey, because if you haven't been connected with your instincts before becoming a mother, you may find that mothering helps you get in touch with those instincts. How can a parent navigate the inevitable periods of grief that accompany the transitions and life changes that their children go through? Should children make, sorry, should parents make their children's grief their grief? Is it important to maintain some distance? What would you say? Wow, that is such a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that their grief is an inevitable part of it, you know, especially when our children leave home. That is such a momentous thing that can really plunge us into our own deep grieving process, not just for the loss of the, or the, the shift in the relationship with the child, but, but kind of the end of an era of our lives and it's a confrontation with limitation and mortality. And I mean, the truth is that I think that confronting those things deepens us and gives us um, more of a spiritual foothold in the world. Um, but it is ours to navigate and not to put on our children. Lisa, would you say that with, with parenting, which is often, I think, associated with maintaining control and, and being very present and creating structure or authority, that the other side of that might be that being a true parent is about letting go and surrendering, about striking that balance between control and authority, but also a releasing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> parenting sort of requires that you do all of that, right? You have to, you have to be warm and firm. <laughs> you have to uh, be able to assert, you know, create structure and control, and you have to let go. And it's, it's really um, kind of an art to figure out when you do one and when you do the other and no one ever totally gets it right. But I, I do think that again, Alyssa, what you're pointing to speaks to the uh, kind of psychological development that we as parents can experience as we try to, to do a decent job at this because being able to, for example, know, okay, now it's time for me to create some structure you know, if you're not good at creating structure, then you're going to have to try to figure that out. And that will help you develop your own skills and, uh, you know, kind of create more ego strength there. And then when it's time to let go, if that's not your forte, but you know, that's the right thing to do, you're going to be tasked with doing your own psychological work so that you can figure out how to do that. It's really, it's really an endeavor. Raising a child is really an endeavor that requires your whole self. Can you speak about the archetype of the puer eternus and the parent's role in that? Wow, that is so interesting. I've never thought about that, but I love that question. Um, I've always been fascinated by puer psychology. And what I imagine is 
And Jung talks about this a little bit in um, Archetypes in the Collective Unconscious in his essay on the mother, you know, sort of mothers who don't let go or, or um, are too smothering or, um, you know, I think about it, Puer psychology kind of maps onto um, dependent narcissism. You know, there's some narcissistic traits that show up in people that kind of have Puer psychology. And narcissism can absolutely be something that um, comes about because of a certain parenting style. So if there's too much enmeshment between the parent and the child, or the parent projects not shadow qualities on the child, but idealizes the child and treats the child, you know, kind of projects their own narcissistic tendencies onto the child and treats the child as if the child is special, that can actually uh, lead to narcissistic traits in the child. There was some really interesting research that came out was it within the past 10 years about um, overval overvaluing your child and how, you know, if you believe that your child deserves special treatment, that kids brought up like that can uh, wind up uh, exhibiting narcissistic traits. So I, I think there, there is a way where, you know, in Neumann in his book, The Great Mother talks about these different attributes of the mother and kind of archetypally, you know, we mentioned these two poles but there, there are different shades of that. And one kind of mother is, um, I, I think it's what Neumann calls the elemental mother, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, she, she is uh, kind of very demanding in a way, demanding that her child go out and face the world. And we do need a little bit of that when we mother too. Okay, I think we're going to transition to the Q&A portion of the session. So let there be light. If you want to turn your <laughs> video back on, you can do that. Um, and we're not going to get through all the questions probably, and we're not going to go in order, just FYI. But um, to start us off, Allison L, you asked a few questions. Would you like to unmute yourself and pick one question and ask it? Allison? Yes, I'm there? here. Okay. Um, I, I think my key question is, you know, I know I'm working through a negative mother complex and one day I would love to, to be a mother too, but I'm kind of scared. What if my daughter turns out to be like my mom? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the reason is I've seen some examples, it's kind of like um, my friends, they would turn out to be like their grandparents generation, like personality wise, it's kind of like flip flop. So yeah, that's kind of a fear. You know, I think when we have a negative mother complex and we ourselves become mothers, there's opportunity for great healing. And I have definitely seen that. Um, but of course, there's a lot of trepidation. And, um, you know, there's, if we've had a negative mother, there may be damage to the instincts. And so uh, we, we, we may really struggle to find our way. Although, as I said, um, usually we do, and, and there can be a lot of healing. And I do talk about that in the book. Uh, in terms of, that's an interesting question to be worried about. Um, I mean, most of the time people say, I don't want to become my mother. And that's the real fear when, when they have kids is, will, will I become my mother? Will it be like my mother? But to worry that your daughter, you know, what I would say, Allison, is that, is that um, what I would imagine is that you might meet your mother in your daughter. And that might be an opportunity for you to um, work through something in a fuller way. Because of course your daughter will have elements of your mother because um, we all have the capability for, 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 all, for all kinds of behavior, right? There's nothing human that is foreign to me. So if your mother was selfish, for example, are you likely to see that your daughter's selfish? Yes, because we are all selfish. 
But in, in meeting that in your daughter, it will be an opportunity for you to come into a new relationship with it. Wow, that sounds amazing. And, and I guess a, a very quick one is, could you um, teach us, like, what, what's the difference between the evil stepmother and Baba Yaga? I'm trying to, um, are they related? Are they like, who is the initi initiatory? Well, uh, just really quickly, cause that's a big question, but I would say really quickly, they're very related because both initiate. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, Sally, you had a question. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, um, this is so lovely. Thanks for this. Um, it was just a question of when your kids leave home and then when you try to reclaim that, you know, independent self that you had really forgotten about because you were so intensely in the parenting mode for so long. Um, how do you, or just if you have any advice as to how to kind of reclaim that, not by regressing to the old self you were, because obviously you transformed a lot the journey yeah what a what a very very important question thank you for asking it i you know there is a kind of loss of self that occurs when we become mothers in particular probably more so than fathers and it can be very disorienting to be on this you know decades long ride with our kids and then have it somewhat abruptly end and to feel like we've been sort of spat out into the blackness of space and where are we who are we now what matters to us and you know i would say that if you find yourself in that position understandably that's a time of grieving and mourning probably not just mourning again the fact that your kids have left, although there's that, but then also this sort of sense of like, who, so, I, so what if I, who, I've lost myself, but, but it, it could be a very fruitful time as well, because it would, it would require of you that you sink into that experience and uh, have, and, and see if you can go into the depths of your own forest to find what matters to you now, who, who are you, what's important and what more needs to come through you into the world as Jim Hollis would say. All right, um, Terry Dawson, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, I was thinking about postpartum depression and um, I know that you're also a practicing uh, analyst and therapist, and you probably work with people suffering from that. And sometimes I, I'm, I'm trying to tease out the biological and the emotional, psychological, all the pieces of that. And what I've noticed is other cultures do a better job of really caring for and slowing down the world when someone's becoming a new mother um, we don't do that at all. In fact, I think we really make heroic the people who don't let it affect their lives as much that get right back to work. And I'm wondering if, if you could speak to that from your experience, both what you see in terms of patterns with that postpartum depression in our culture, and if you have any thoughts maybe about how we could try and change that. Yeah, that's, that's a lovely question. Um, so my understanding is that postpartum depression, first of all, I, I absolutely believe that there's something biological that goes on, right? I think that's really well established. And, you know, from, from my own experience, I can feel right into that. There's something about the hormonal stuff. But, you know, those who suffer from postpartum depression tend to you know, um, the, 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 the things that correlate with it tend to be um, having a difficult relationship with your own mother, experiencing a significant loss, you know, right around the time, you know, shortly before the birth and that sort of thing. So clearly it's not just biology. There, there is real psychological stuff there. And I so appreciated what you said about how other cultures slow the world down. I think that's a lovely way to put it. 
Um, and I, I, I do know in, in other cultures, there's, there's, uh, you know, there are places for, I used to just daydream about just, just <laughs> being somewhere where I could just take a nap and just know that my children were really well cared for. <laughs> that was what I wanted. Um, but, you know, we just don't really, um, we do, we sort of celebrate this very kind of masculine mentality of toughing it out, getting right back to work, don't let it slow you down. And I, I do think that this, um, in a way, kind of desacralizes the experience, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, it doesn't give us the, the space to, to rest into it. And if we had that more, would we, would there be less postpartum depression? I, I think it's, I think it's possible. I mean, new motherhood in, in the United States, at least, is so profoundly isolating as well. Yes. All right, for our next question, I'm gonna read it to you, Lisa. This is from Dean. What do you make of the rise of polyamory in relation to motherhood? Is it viable for a mother to be polyamorous? How might this affect the children? You know, I've actually written something on that. And <laughs> this is a really, uh, this is a controversial question, but I'm gonna wade right in. Um, I am sure that there are people who are polyamorous and have children and do it well. I do not believe that it is impossible to do that well. And I um, know that, that many people who are polyamorous um, think about it very carefully and work on it very carefully. However, I am suspicious. And in my experience, which albeit is limited, I have seen many people practicing polyamory as um, I think it's often done as a kind of defense against intimacy. Um, and it's kind of easy to do that now because it feels sort of edgy and hip and it's got a little cachet. And so you can sort of subscribe to this lifestyle and almost get some kind of um, progressive points for it without necessarily doing the psychological work around it, specifically as it relates to kids. Um, you know, I, I'm, I think there have been some studies and I don't, haven't looked at them, but I'm, I'm sure they're out there and you should certainly check those out and not just take my word from it. But what I will say is that um, Pursuing a new relationship, and I know people in the in the poly community will talk about new relationship energy, and we all know what that feels like, that wonderful feeling when you're falling in love. You know, as far as I'm concerned, there's a reason why that wears off after a bit. It's because you're, you're you know, after you've fallen in love and had this wonderful limerence and gotten married and there's been this honeymoon, you know, metaphorical or actual and, and then the kids come along and by the time the kids come along, some of that new relationship energy has worn off a bit. And it's more about, you know, um, hanging out over Netflix while you fold laundry. Then you've got the, um, the emotional space to fall in love with the baby. And that is what we do. I mean, Winnicott talked about maternal preoccupation and you know, I mean, I think many people who have been mothers can relate to that sense of like, just not, just not being able to take your eyes off of them, you know? And, and I, I know, certainly I have seen it, that people that are involved in polyamory who aren't doing it carefully can be so swept up in the, in pursuing these different relationships that, that sort of, um, uh, that the, the falling in love with the baby or, or sort of staying in love with the child gets maybe pushed to the side a little bit. So I have my concerns about it. Um, this is a question from Kristen. I'm going to read it for her. Um, can you speak to the path of having a mother to being a mother to losing a mother? My sisters and I are struggling with our mother's recent death via Alzheimer's. We are all mothers. Our father is revealing his memories to us of mom's struggles with marriage and motherhood and her deep unhappiness as they tried to hide it from us. Um, th these stories do not resonate with our experience. We are stunned by our own varying recollections of her mothering. Wow, wow. 
Well, I'm so I'm so sorry to hear about um, your 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 loss, and um, what a very big question. And um, so so if I hear this question right, um, uh, you're 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 both being a mother and and then hearing from your father for the first time perhaps that your your own mother really struggled with being a mother and was when unhappy at times. And you know, I think that this um, if if I've got the story right, you didn't feel that you felt loved and you felt enjoyed. And and perhaps the truth is that both are possible that she that she loved and enjoyed you and was also dissatisfied in some way. And it speaks to how very, very complex we all are. Um, that, that, that both things might be true, but, but what it is a journey, isn't it? To, to having a mother, to being a mother and then, and then losing a mother. And you know what, I'll just, I'll share a personal story because I, I feel moved by what you've shared. I lost my mother to dementia about two years ago and it was a long time coming. It was not a surprise. It wasn't a jolt. I was lucky to be there at the end. But what happened, you know, 15 minutes later shocked me because I felt absolutely sick to my stomach. And it wasn't out of grief. It was out of this realization that I had not been as good of a mother to my children as I felt she had been to me. And, um, and, and I don't think that that was in fact actually true. And, and I, you know, that's, that feeling didn't stay with me for long, but I, but I think, but it was a really interesting thing to have happen right after she died, that that's where I went. And that, that somehow it was, it was trying to fit myself into her shoes and, and being grateful for what she had given me. And at the same time, she was not perfect, nor was she happy all the time in the role. Um, so what, just what a crazy, complex, kaleidoscopic thing it is, is maybe all I can say. For our next question, Charles, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in the dynamic of the otherwise strong protective father who does not protect the child from the cruel um, mother or especially the cruel stepmother. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in there and I'd like to hear your thoughts. There, there is a lot of interesting stuff in there. And of course, it is a, a story that happens all the time in fairy tales, but it does happen a lot in, in real life. And we might wonder about the father's relationship with his own mother or, or his relationship to the feminine, that he is unable to um, claim any authority against this kind of overbearing um, uh, mother or, or stepmother. But it's a horrible portrayal of the child not to be protected. And you know, I've certainly worked with people in that situation who grew up in exactly that situation where they were not protected. And sometimes, you know, I, I think that. Um, you know, if we had a if we had an abusive father, say, and our mother didn't protect us, it's the relationship with the mother is almost harder than the relationship with the father. Because, or or in your case, Charles, what you're bringing up, where that the mother is the one who's cruel or abusive, and the father didn't protect. Again, it's sort of it's fairly straightforward to decide how we feel about the abusive parent. But the parent who maybe was was loving sometimes, but then stood by and watched and let this happen to us, that is a very hard thing to come to terms with. Okay, uh, Pamela, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, you know, I can identify, I saw on your 
on your website too, Lisa, that like, you know, you sort of didn't want to have kids and then you did and you like got really into it in some ways. And I have three children. They're five, three, and almost two. Oh, God and bless. I'm like, I'm not there yet. You know, like I've been trying to see it as an opportunity um, to expand myself and to heal. And it's sort of like not sticking. And I'm trying to, I'm sort of wondering, maybe I was just right. Like maybe I just was not in fact sort of mother material. And I was wondering if you had thoughts about that. Like, is it just sort of our, our wounds or our baggage that keeps us from being good mothers? Or like, there are really some people that don't really have the capacity well, Pamela, I have to say that I imagine that that your being here and even asking that question, my guess is that you you are a good mother, because I think that um, because I think it's it's anyone who's who's even thinking about these things, my guess is is a good mother. But what I'm hearing is that you don't feel like you're a good mother, and of course, I don't. I don't know more about that story or, or what that means to you or how that's showing up in your life. But I, I will say this, I think that um, in, order to, in order for things to be sort of working, we need to enjoy our kids and they have to be a source of pleasure. And, you know, to be, to be very honest, when they're two and three, there's a lot, there's many hours in the day when they are not a source of pleasure, even I think under the very best of circumstances. It's really, really hard. Um, uh, you know, I mean, toddlers are adorable and I think nature made them adorable so that we don't kill them um, because they really, they really are pretty challenging. What happens when we enjoy them is then uh, we wanna be around them um, we, we, we feel competent. Um, and, and so there's like a virtuous cycle that gets going because we feel, you know, we feel capable when we're with them, we can set limits or we can soothe them. That makes us feel good about ourselves. That makes us enjoy them. That makes us want to be around them more. That makes us more attached. Therefore we're more competent and on and on like that. What can happen is that cycle gets disrupted somehow or never gets going. And that can happen when we're overwhelmed, when we're not well supported, when we're dealing with um, physical illness or our own um, psychological difficulties, or we have a problem with our spouse or, or we're overworked or any number of things. And then let's say we're exhausted and we're tired and we're cranky and our toddler gets upset and instead of comforting him, we, we blow up at him. And then he melts down even more. Then we don't feel competent. We're not, we, then we feel badly about ourselves. We, we feel, we don't, we don't, our, our kid is not a source of um, kind of positive uh, feedback about, about who we are. It, it's the reverse. We feel terrible about ourselves. We feel like we're, we feel like we're a bad mother. That makes us not want to be around the kid. It means the kid is not a source of, of pleasure, which makes us a little bit less connected, which makes us feel worse about ourselves, which makes us want to avoid our kids and on and on like that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I think when we feel like bad mothers, what we need is some more support so that we can reverse that cycle and get back to feeling connected. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Uh, I think there's sort of a real tension between sometimes mothers are asked to, you know, like it would go better if you were more present, right? Like if you could be more present in the moment and like uh, show your children full attention, then you would get those gifts of the reward and start the virtuous cycle. But like sometimes it's just not tr true. Like focusing on the child who's tantruming and you're both like on the edge and stuff does not 100% of the time actually uh, get get you what um, it's promised. And so I'm sort of trying to make make my peace with the fact that some of the words, rewards may well be in the future, even though we still have to kind of cope with the present. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for, for bringing that up. I mean, I, I think that sometimes there's just um, the expectations set for mothers, both about what we're supposed to do and about how we're supposed to feel 
are really unrealistic and it can set us up for difficulty because, you know, some days we are going to be Kali who's going to want to eat her kids. And we have to understand that that's just normal. And it, it, it often, you know, this idea that, that we're just going to kind of create a Zen like calm while, while our toddler tantrums, like, no, you know, like just like half the time, I just wanted to bury my kids in the backyard when they were that age. And it wasn't, it, there was no reward at that moment. Now, maybe later when, you know, he said something utterly adorable and, you know, made me laugh. Okay. That was rewarding, but like, no, there's, there's nothing rewarding about a tantrum. And, and so, and so Pamela, I hope you get some little rewards throughout the day. And I, and I hope that you continue to find that the rewards increase as they get older and a little easier and, and be gentle with yourself. All right, we have one last question. Elena, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, sure. So um, my question was, um, is it possible when a mother is kind of too like strongly gripped by the mother archetype in a way that maternal instincts are really kind of felt as a right and that causing kind of a semi puella thing to happen like not quite in the sense that you normally think about it with um you know but having like a little bit of that light and ground equality but being like dragged back by the mother's projection of say helplessness and uh inadequacy that's been like put onto you and uh feeling like you're responsible for their needs and then going out until i feel you're responsible for other people's needs and kind of feeling like that sense of being incapable of going out and being able to be independent and do things. Mm. Yeah, I mean, to me, that sounds a lot like, again, what Jung talks about in the essay on the mother archetype and um, archetypes in the collective unconscious that, you know, almost a kind of like smothering mother. I mean, you brought up this, this mother who feels kind of so entitled to maybe kind of power and control over her children. And I believe, I believe Jung talks about this, that, you know, this, this can be this, um, this way in which certain mothers uh, have a kind of often very cloaked and hidden drive to power that manifests in their relationship with their children. I feel like this is maybe a little less common than it used to be because thank goodness women have other ways to seek power these days. But you know, if you're the kind of woman who comes into the world and you have a certain drive for power and you don't have any other way to find expression for it, you might be this woman who is incredibly domineering. And uh, you know, if that's kind of combined with a lack of, um, let's say attunement or compassion for your kids, I think it can um, go really poorly. I, I guess just to follow up real quick, would you feel like that kind of falls at least partly in the Puella kind of category or would you actually categorize that as something different? You mean that the, that the daughter, let's say, would kind of have a Puella sort of... Uh, yeah, that's kind of where I was going with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that could be how it manifested. I don't know that it would always be that way. I don't I don't think it's a formula like that. But certainly if the result is that the daughter feels um sort of uh unable to claim her own power and go out in the world. I mean, the one thing I would say is that I don't I don't think that this idea about Puer and Puella is really relevant until maybe the 30s, because I think we should be Puers and Puellas in the 20s. I think we should be um, sort of uh, trying different things and, um, and, and and putting ourselves first in a way. Uh, um, I, so, so when people come to me and they say, well, you know, am I a poo air? It's like, you're 27, <laughs> go have fun. Um, so, so, but I would think if that, if that lasted for a while, Elena, then I, then I would think, okay, yeah, we could maybe, we could maybe call it that. But, but what I'm imagining is if this daughter is 
finding it difficult to get her footing out in the world because she's had a domineering mother. I, I would give her some time before I would label her Puella. It might just be that this is a, a kind of a psychological task that she has to go through in her first essays out into the world. That was really helpful. Thank you very much. All right, to close things out, Lisa, would you like to tell us about your forthcoming book? Sure, thank you. Yes, my book is called Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself, and it, it is being published by Sounds True and will be out on May 25th. And my author website is lisamarciano.com. You can uh, go there to uh, read an excerpt from the book. And um, also you can sign up for my free email course if you pre-order the book. Thank you so much, Lisa, for coming today. Everybody, let's give Lisa a silent round of applause. It was lovely to have you join us today to speak on the shadow and motherhood. Next week, we continue the Shadow Play Speaker Series. Um, we'll be hosting Lubomir Arsoff, who is the creator of In Shadow, the short film, which you can watch on YouTube. And the following week, Michael Mead of the Living Myth Podcast will also be joining us. So you can RSVP at the stoa.ca as well as check out other events that we're hosting on the STOA. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa.